like a real simple like, I don't know, like flower life or something. Oh, like vector that. mark. <coughs> hey everyone, it's Walker and Nick at Full Spectrum Laser, and welcome to Laser Talk Live. What's up, guys? Once again, we're back here. It's Wednesday. It's four o'clock. You know what we're here for. We're here to talk about lasers. Uh, with really, I mean, the smartest guy when it comes to lasers there is probably on the planet. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, right. I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. So this, today we have uh, a few topics I think people are going to be really excited about. We've actually had a handful of people ask questions about that even up to today. Uh, and one of the first ones is maintenance. And that's what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. So we're going to talk about some of the things to look for. We're actually going through an example of changing out or uh, cleaning the lens on a Pro Series uh, uh, lens. Uh, then what are we going to do in the first topic, Walker? So then we're going to talk about accessories for your laser cut projects. Right, so these are the type of things that uh, outside of the material you use to cut and uh, make your projects, little things that cost you know, a penny or two that can add significant value, function, and uh, really just make uh, a lot of your projects a lot neater uh, than they would yeah. be otherwise. Something that you technically can't really make with a laser cut, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Unless you have too much time on your hands. And that would take a lot of time on uh, stacking, probably, yeah. in some of the cases, yeah. So without further ado, let's go right into our first topic. That's the uh, accessories. Now, a lot of people submit projects, and a lot of the questions we get is, well, how'd they do this with laser? Well, what's this with laser? And really, the secret is, the laser is the gateway to um, kind of your big Lego blocks. That's kind of the way I explain it to my mom, is I used to play with Legos all the time as a kid, and when I would get like the big projects, like the big, I remember I got the uh, pirate ship. I didn't really care about the pirate ship. There was four pieces in there that were really neat that I wanted to use to like make other things. Mm -hmm. And now it's like with the laser cutter, I can laser cut my own Lego pieces. That's Any Lego analogy. piece I want. Yeah, thanks. I man. like that. So uh, now those special Lego pieces though that you can't really Lego cut, uh, or laser cut. <laughs> Lego cut. Lego cut's a new technology. <laughs> where <you gotta laughs> I'm sorry if I... My bad. We'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, these laser cut pieces, though, um, these accessories that go along with it, though, we can start pulling a few up. They're, um, they're really useful, and I think you actually used a few of them last week on your laser uh, leather bracelet, right? Yeah, definitely. So I work with a lot of leather, and these are some <laughs> things that uh, you can't, you know, obviously you can't make these things, and they will add to your project. So if you're doing some sort of wristwatch band, something of that sort, these are the type of things that you want to purchase in addition to your material. Absolutely, and you see in the uh, top corner there some of those, uh, uh, what, are the, what would you call that, those little uh, posts that you use for the uh, bracelet? So those guys are called hitch fasteners. Okay. Sometimes Some people call them hitch buttons. They have multiple names, but I like those guys because you literally can just laser cut a hole and then fit those in, and they just pop in and out. So that's probably your cheapest option. At first, I really didn't like them, but they're growing on me because they're so easy to use. You could just screw those on. Um, now, some of these you do need a special tool, and if they're kind of scary at first, like it, it is a bit off putting because they have these little special tools that you lose. <laughs> and I think the manufacturers purposely do that. So you have to buy another one? Yeah, yeah, you have to buy the whole pack to buy this little special tool. So, right under those hitch fasteners, we have those guys are called. What are those guys called? I'm um, not uh, sure, but they're basically <laughs> they're, uh, two, a set of screws uh, that has a threaded side and, and a, uh, a seated side uh, yeah. where you can basically, uh, with just your hands or with just you know uh, a uh, coin, uh, screw yeah, pieces together. So simple screwdriver. Um, a lot of people use this for samples or to, oh, Walker, welcome to your uh, first live episode. <laughs> Uh, he's going to silent his phone real quick so we don't get alerts about his own My third eBay account. His third like on his Instagram. <laughs> from last week. So oh, that's both good. Both his aunts and his mom have seen it now. Excellent. Uh, either <coughs> way, so up in the top corner as well, you can see kind of the same thing, another form of fastener that kind of rivets together, uh, again, with another special tool, right? Uh, now, those rivets specifically, these guys are awesome because you can just laser cut a hole and then pu push them together and then hit them with a little mallet. So, so you just flatten those guys. Oh wow, so that's pretty convenient. Yeah, uh, the buckle is a buckle. So once you uh, flatten that with a with a hammer down with a rivet, that's sealed forever, right? That's not a snap that comes undone. No, it doesn't come undone, and that's what's great about the guys with the screws. Um, they just screw together, and if you want to disassemble it, you can. And you can see those ones come in different thicknesses for different materials. 
Uh, what's kind of neat about those rivets is that's a neat way to um, put together leather or different pieces of fabric or mixed uh, material. So if you're going to do yeah. like a fabric to a wood or something like that, those are really convenient way to attach without having to worry about sewing or attaching or using any su su type of glue. Yeah, if you if you don't like sewing, that's that's a lot of work, oh, honestly. A ton of work, yeah. And yeah. if you want to laser cut something, just put a hole in it and just snap those rivets on with a little hammer. Like it's perfect. Absolutely. Then uh, down on the right, you can see all those different kind of uh, what do you call those? Studs. Those are like studs, typically like the punk rockers made yeah. that cool, but a lot of things rock rock those. You yeah, know? Uh, like a, a lot of the people who do accessories for motorcycles and different things like that, correct? Yeah, definitely. All right, excellent. So if you, uh, do we have another uh, graphic with uh, some accessories? These are the accessories. We oh, those ones we pulled up? Okay, yeah. so um, along with that, if you can imagine uh, when you're mixing uh, mediums or anytime you're putting together two different types of material and glue isn't an option, those type of fasteners are something you can think about. Now, other real obvious low-hanging fruit, if you will, you think about as accessories for um, lasers is keychains. Oh yeah. You can buy thousands of keychains on Amazon where they'll cost you a fraction of a penny a piece, maybe a few pennies a piece for nicer ones, and that most of them come with either a little screw that you can screw into the wood, or you can just put buy another a thousand pack of uh, looped uh, rings oh from yeah. Amazon and put those two items together, and for you know four or five cents overhead per piece, you can have little keychain sets uh, made one and done. Uh, keychains are one of the easiest things you can do with your laser and. When you say keychain, that's a broader topic for things that are, you know, can also apply dog cha chains, um, uh, luggage chains. Um, a lot of people use it for specialized tags for their gear and equipment. Uh, a photographer friend of mine had me make tags for all of his, uh, um, what do you call them, those black cases. Pelican so he, cases. Pelican yeah. cases, right. So each, inside each pelican case, you can look at the tag and see what's inside because he has 12 of them all look the same. Mm -hmm. And when you label the outside of those pelican cases with, you know, camera gear or what's inside, they grow legs pretty quick and yeah. people walk off. So you can laser cut like useless item that's worth nothing. <laughs> yeah, basically that's what we did. There. We labeled all of his camera gear as, you know, receptacles for, a, you know, biochemical waste and other things there like that go. that just no one wants any anything to do with. Good, <laughs> good plan. And then um, one of the other uh, kind of uh, neat accessories when, when you think of uh, going back and forth with um, what you can use with what you're cutting with the thing is, is all the different adhesives and then mixed adhesives that can go together where you make hinges. Um, I believe you make some of your hinges with cloth, uh, correct? Yeah. yeah so uh, if you can think also using mixed medium, sometimes the accessory that you need to uh, create a hinge or create a little dynamic on your project, you can laser cut in yeah. the case of, you know. It depends on how clever you want to be. Absolutely, and how much time you want to take. And a lot of these things really are just time savers in general because really next mm -hmm. week we'll talk a lot about uh, fashion and uh, Really, when you start talking about jewelry, you're talking necklaces, earrings, um, pins, um, you know, all different types of little accessories where a laser cut item or a laser engraved item plus any one of those things is an automatic uh, fashion accessory. So just by getting, you know, you can get bulks of chains, bulks of those rings, like we said, and bulks of fasteners on Amazon or even places like uh, Romark has uh, items from laser bits. Uh, where they have a bunch of pre-made items that just take uh, a little bit to engrave. So from uh, different keychains that just have, you know, different areas that can be engraved uh, to I think they even have these really great uh, ceramic uh, plaques now where there's like a granite and uh, other types of uh, small plaques, so much like the 12 by 12 that we have. Mm -hmm. They have like 4 by 4, 6 by 6, some of them are heart-shaped, some of them are round, oval. Uh, they're really great accessories. So cruise through the uh, Romark section on Johnson Plastics Plus again. Uh, we'll throw the link down below uh, so you can see it uh, when we repost this. But again, you get a 10% discount if you're an FSL customer. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to uh, mention with the accessories? No, they're just good to keep in mind uh, because you can't laser cut everything and you don't want to limit yourself to your product just being laser cut. Absolutely. This adds value to your project. Absolutely. So even something as simple as a wallet by adding just a little bit of a snap, a button, a rivet, uh, really, really uh, not only adds the value, but really uh, brings up the ability to for, I guess that's value in the sense because you can sell that product for more now. So mm -hmm. uh, also think about that. You can add a little, um, we call it flair to your projects, which is a little bit like that. Um, and, you know, other things to think about is even things when you're doing coasters or um, if you're engraving tiles for people, 
going into Home Depot, Joann's, or again, uh, they sell these on uh, the Romark and the Johnson Plastics website, but little rubber feet for underneath a lot of those items, whether it's coasters, um, you know, tile sets, uh, things like that. That's a really easy item to add, just a little bit of value to what you're engraving and adding to people. Um, the other thing I think is the probably the safest thing to mention is um, hardware for hanging items. So if you're making large um, laser art, really what you want to do is turn that art into uh, your client with uh, hanging hardware on the back so they can easily hang it in their home. So uh, Home Depot, Lowe's have tons of options for that if you want to go and check that out. But really, uh, Joann's, if you go in the back, their framing section, they have a great section uh, full of hardware for different types of frames and different things like that. So check that out and uh, think about that too when you're making your pieces that you're uh, turning into clients and friends and family. They have a nice piece <coughs> of hardware on the back to hang it up real nice. That's, that's what makes you professional, right? Absolutely. You don't just make it and then think that it's done just because it's laser cut. Yep. Adding all those little accents and stuff, actually being able to hang it, that's what's nice. Yeah, I think that's what takes you from a maker to a professional maker. Definitely. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to the good stuff. Now, this is not everyone's favorite to topic. People don't even like going to the store or, sorry, to the... Um, uh, what do you call it, the oil change place to get their oil oh, change yeah. in their car. So like maintenance in general, people aren't a big fan of. Unfortunately mm -hmm. though, it is a necessary evil with your laser. So if you want to get the most out of your laser and that's the most length, life, uh, productivity, efficiency from your laser, you really, really want to keep up on your maintenance schedule. Now, if you go through your user manual, uh, Scott's done a great job of highlighting your uh, weekly, monthly, and quarterly um, maintenance schedules and um, keeping up with those. The one that we wanted to talk about today, and it's one that I don't think enough people spend enough time with, is the um, cleanliness of your lens. Now, yes. with the Pro Series lens, it's a little tricky to get in there, but uh, Walker, what's some of the reasons why you want to keep that lens nice and clean? So it's focusing your beam to that small beam width. If it's dirty, cracked, something of that sort, then your beam is not going to be clean. It's going to be fragmented and you're not going to cut well. Absolutely. So you can imagine if you're looking through a dirty pair of glasses or if you have a smudge on your camera lens, that same way that your image is passing through a dirty piece of glass, your beam of light that's going to be used to vaporize at a very precise level, um, your material is passing through an optics that just is now instead of uh, freely letting the beam pass through and focusing correctly, it's f literally fighting through some of the material that's built up. Um, mm -hmm. The cleanliness of your, uh, of your lens really can't be understated. Uh, that's why we include in with your packet um, a few of these Zeiss lens wipes. Let's see, make sure we get a good focus on that, but uh, no shout out to Zeiss, but they do make amazing uh, uh, you know, optics for uh, all your cameras, but these Zeiss lens wipes that get included in with your uh, uh, kit are there for a reason. I mean, there are times in large engraving jobs, I'll clean the optics in the middle of the job just to make sure it's clean and not getting built up, because really, once that buildup starts occurring on your lens and the beam's passing through, what, what occurs then? So, you want to always keep it clean, because if it's dirty, and you're like, oh, it's not that dirty, you know? Right. Uh, th as that beam and that power passes through that lens and hits the small debris, it's going to eventually ruin your lens. We have some examples of that, don't we? Yeah, let's pull them up. Yeah, Charles, why don't we look at... Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, so that, it gets, it gets pretty gross pretty quick, so... Um, so that one's just dirty. Yeah. That one needs a clean. And well, this one actually, this one uh, cracked from result of having so much buildup and residue that it just kept holding all the, uh, the heat from the... Yeah, it can crack. hold the heat and crack. You can tighten that little ring too much Absolutely. and it cracks. Yep. Uh, sometimes it's barely, you know, you can barely see that crack. And so you don't think anything of it. You put it back in there and then this is a result. What's the uh, next one we have, Charles? Here's so another. This is a dirty mirror. Dirty mirror, absolutely. And it's the same exact thing. Now that mirror is just polished down metal, right? With a little bit of a coating on it that makes it reflective. It's not actually passing through glass. It's just reflecting off that mirror. Yeah, it's just a reflector and right. it's the same exact thing. And it's almost worse in a way that I, it, that's further down the line. Uh, that's closest to the output. Absolutely. So that beam can scatter from that point while it's getting to your lens. Absolutely. You can imagine if you had, um, you know, really, 
a huge smudge like that on your camera lens and then you were trying to take a good photo, uh, you wouldn't expect that photo to turn out very good. You would look at that lens and go, oh, that's probably going to be a pretty dirty, smudgy, bad vacation photo. I think we have one more photo. Oh, one more? Oh. oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, here's a good one where it's actually scorched and burned down. You can actually see where the... Uh, the beam was starting to almost split and start affecting two different areas. Yeah, I mean, this could be caused by multiple things, but it's definitely like it was out of alignment. They never cleaned it. They ran the job. Chain the alignment came out of alignment even almost more. Almost a perfect storm of things not to do uh, in that photo. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And yes. then we have one more, I think. Is there one more, Charles? The clean one? Yeah. All right, now, uh, this is one I wanted to show. This is actually on the laser itself. Wait, that's a diode exiting, right? Th that is actually, looks like the actual output on the laser itself. So you can take that metal cap off, and not a lot of people know that there's an actual lens at the end of your laser tube. Well, that's what starts the beam, right? And gets yeah. it focused uh, going down the travel. Exactly. Right. And that can get dirty, and a lot of people have gone through alignment, cleaned all their mirrors, lenses, and they're like, still, I don't know what's going on. Right. That's it's usually the culprit. Right yeah. yeah. And uh, you can notice, too, on hobby lasers, especially if you're a Muse user, uh, that your exhaust sort of goes over that area. And you can see that a few of your mirrors actually require just a little bit more love than the other mirrors just because of the direction of the exhaust. So if you can think about that, too, some of the positioning in your bed, obviously the top left-hand corner is going to have the shortest path travel for your beam to go, so you can have the most power in the top left-hand corner. It's also, though, when you're using the top left-hand corner, you're exposing a lot of those mirrors to uh, the exhaust. So just kind of keep that in mind. I usually try to keep the, uh, the job actually more in the center of the, uh, the laser because it kind of keeps me uh, more checked uh, with alignment. So if I'm a little out of alignment, I mm -hmm. really do take a minute to just uh, realign the laser real quick because you really do notice when you're in the middle of the bed and you kind of get to the bottom corner. Where if you're in the top left-hand corner of the bed, a lot of times you don't quite notice that you've gone out of alignment a little bit no. until you're noticing that your engravings don't quite look right. And it's like, uh, it seems in line. Uh, but it's really yeah. not. It's just it's came a little out of line. It's just the nature of you know doing engravings. I do a lot of engravings. You um, are the raster master. The raster master, they say. Yeah. yeah they um, uh, when you're doing a lot of engravings, especially if you're going fast, uh, just know that jogging back and forth is just giving a little bit of jostling to your machine. And just something to keep uh, keep in mind. Uh, one thing you do to combat that though is slow the laser head down a little bit. This also keeps your um, engravings a little bit more accurate. Yeah, if you have high details, slow that laser down and you're going to hit it with that power setting perfectly. Absolutely. So now we're going to go through uh, this process here with the, um, uh, with the Pro Series lens, right? Yeah, so this guy, this is your laser head and your lens is inside. Now this comes off, you remove the air assist right here and then there's a thumb screw, two thumb screws for this guy particularly. So essentially you're taking off this assembly piece from the laser to do this uh, process. Yeah, so this okay. slides, slides out right after down. all that, and then if we pull the camera down, yep. we'll take a look at I it. I got you. All righty. Just looks like it's going to get a little loose here. You got it? There we, there go. we go. So what I like to do is I will loosen this guy up. This is awesome that it just screws off. And then you'll see the lens inside there. Now, this has a, I believe they call it ring collar uh, screw. Yeah, there you go. So you can see there's just a little bit of a ring there around the lens. Yeah, and it's, it's a little dirty, honestly. And it looks like there's a chip on the edge from somebody tightening it down way too much. Yeah, it looks like this is from one of our older Pro machines. So I would probably replace this guy if I was going to, you know, be picky. Okay. So you get a tool, though, that it's included with the... Uh yeah, so inside your tool kit, there will be this baggie. And a lot of people don't know what this guy's for. And we're going to show you. So this guy just goes in here. And it's essentially a big flathead screwdriver. And we're just going to spin this guy upside down until this collar screw comes out. So this collar screw is basically just seating the lens inside the cone apparatus here. So this is not something you want to tighten down too much. It's not something you want to torque down at all. It's something you want to have just tight enough to keep the lens in place. Now this guy will come out 
And you want to use this tool. This tool is very important. Yep. I've used little screwdrivers on my own and scratched my lens. Yep. That's exactly why we include it. So as you can see, this is basically just a small threaded ring that sits inside of it with a flat edge. So there's a little rubber O-ring. Now this rubber O-ring helps with that compression so that hopefully you're not pressing down too hard and also prevents the metal from touching the glass directly. Exactly. It's like you're a pro or something. I mean, this is laser talk. <laughs> so you can see that that lens has a little chip out of it. So we're going to go ahead and replace it. And this is our replacement lens. This is how they come. And you just pop this guy open. They have foam for safety. And they're wrapped in this microfiber cloth. So the microfiber cloth is important. It's very similar to uh, the lens kit that you get. You want to make sure that you're using proper um, cloths when you're wiping off your optics so that any dirt on it doesn't create a scratch. Do not use cotton swaps. That's yeah. a common, common yeah. thing. Don't use, um, another one is um, the, oh, I guess that's what you're saying, cotton swabs, like the um, Q-tip, right? Yeah, no Q-tips. Yeah, no Q-tips. Nothing of that sort. What's that? Sure. Uh, right, so like <laughs> our uh, Scott's yeah, also no mentioning like the inside of your shirt, not the best. Not the best. Not the best. Now Unless you have a microfiber shirt and then yeah. look at you. Then not you're yeah. fancy. Then you're probably super fancy. So this lens has to be convex side up. So when it's upside down, convex side up. So um, as right now, we're looking at the portion that uh, would be facing towards the material, right? Yeah, so upside down, we're looking at it. And this is going to be concave as we look at it. OK, so essentially, the curved side of the lens needs to be facing from the direction the beam's coming from, correct? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Con, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> OK, so we're yeah. going to place the O-ring, correct? Yeah, O-ring back in there. And just set it flush on top of that lens, making sure that you don't touch that lens itself. You just replaced it. You just you know, got yep. a new one, so you don't want to ruin it instantly. Set this guy on here. And I'll usually start it with my fingers. And then I'll go back with the tool. It's a lot easier on on the, a tabletop like this. Right, and then we put down this cloth too just to make sure that we could set the lens down someplace safe and make sure it was okay. So what we're gonna do is put this old lens back in this casing and we're actually gonna hold on to this because in a pinch, it's always good to have another piece of glass available that will work. Uh, because even though that has a little chip in it, that would still work out yeah. just fine. But just for the case of example here, we're just gonna switch it out. And then we'll just screw this guy back on. You'll shove this guy back in, thumb screw, and add your air assist, and, and you're good to go. There it is. You got that, Charles? Appreciate you, sir. Oops, it looks like I'm not helping at all with that. So Oops. I would say, speaking of lenses. Speaking of lenses, we got a lens to give to someone, don't we? Yeah, we do. Goodness. So we got a weekly contest winner every week here at Full Spectrum Laser. If you submit your best project that you've made with the laser, well, what we're going to do, yeah, we just got a little camera slippage there. <laughs> um, what we're going to do is we're going to check out the hashtag FSL Weekly Contest. And if you tag us and put us in there, just like you see the information down here below, uh, what we'll do is we'll give away a free lens kit or a uh, you know $250 credit towards FSL if you're looking to buy a new laser tube or upgrade your laser system, et cetera. And this week we got a contest winner, don't we? We do. A really cool one. So we have some wooden rings. Now, if you look, this wooden ring, the uh, one down below that uh, Mr. Thomas Andrew made here, great job, Thomas, by the way. This is just a, a great pot project. Down below, he's cut that out of, it looks like a three-ply, uh, wood and you can cut the different ring size based on the inner diameter and then he polishes up and adds a little bit of uh, I'm not sure what type of finish on the outside nor do I want to try to guess his secrets yeah. here <laughs> But it's got a great little finish on the outside that gives it just a wonderful look I'm actually gonna try to make a couple of these rings this weekend. Yeah. Uh, maybe with a different cool little shape up top uh, I don't know how crazy I'm gonna get <laughs> um, But this uh, this is a great project uh, Andrew congratulations. We'll be reaching out today Yay! We'll be reaching out uh, today to let you know how you can claim your prize and uh, get your free lens kit or a $250 credit uh, on FSL.com. Uh, so uh, what else we have here in the third block? Oh, we got a couple specials. We have not too many of these left. So if you have considered getting our Muse combo special with the riser rotary uh, and the uh, Muse chiller, 
That is still $5,000. We have a handful left that we can do at this price. Uh, it's an introductory special um, that we are going to do. So if you've been on the fence thinking about getting a Muse, this is probably the best deal we've done in a while. This is about yeah. a little over $2,000 worth of the product, just uh, basically giving away for free uh, to put it together in this uh, package deal. Uh, so you get the new cool box, which is the air compressor and your uh, water chiller in there. And you get an exhaust fan that goes in the back, riser rotary, uh, so you can do uh, routed objects, uh, large objects. I mean. You are, this is a maker station, ready to happen. Yeah, you're yeah. doing everything with this guy. Absolutely, so as soon as you get this, you're ready to do tumblers, you're ready to do large objects, boxes, whatever. Um, we also have a, if you're looking for a little bit more professional uh, approach, though we also have a sale on the Pro 24, so it's a thousand dollars off our Pro 24. This is our best Pro Series, or at uh, best, our most popular Pro Series. That's probably a better way to put yeah. it. We sell more of these things than we do any of our other our Pro Series lasers because it's the least expensive way to get into a 90 watt system. It's got pass through doors, so you can put a two foot wide piece of material right in, pass it through the bass, the doors. You've got a motorized Z table, uh, Ethernet connection. You connect the, uh, via uh, Ethernet to Wi Fi uh, with these systems like we do in our uh, lab. Uh, all these Pro systems will be upgradable to RE3 when those upgrades come out. So $1,000 off the Pro 24 system. Uh, really consider this if you're thinking about opening a small business or get going. Uh, this will fit through most doors in your, uh, like a standard three foot door, you can uh, push this through. It won't fit through a two and a half foot door, but any three foot outside door, this will slide right through. So this will go in a lot of offices. Uh, best way to get into a pro machine right there. Yeah, Easy. and like you said, the size is awesome. If you don't have the room for a 48, 36, definitely the 24. The 24 is the way to go, absolutely. And really, it's just uh, the longevity of the 90 watt system lasts, I think. That speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, we did see some chatter online that someone had mentioned that a pro series system is four times faster than a hobby series system. That's not accurate at all. Um, that would be pretty hard to do. Um, if you were wanted to compare a fiber system, to a CO2 system, that's about a four times difference. Um, so if you compare uh, maybe that four by four square we did um, on the fiber to the four by square square we did on the Pro CO2, that was about a three and a half to four to one uh, time difference depending on settings, speeds, and passes. Um, so if you're thinking engraving speed, fiber to CO2, that's about a four to one ratio. Yeah. But with the Pro to um, Hobby, really the big difference is if you are using the larger motors, uh, a lot of times larger motors have the larger rails, so if a 48 actually moves about the same speed as a hobby, about an inch per second um, on the vector marking, and then that translates about the same as far as uh, raster speed. Um, really the hobby is pretty quick um, in comparison to a lot of different things, and if you want to compare it to the Glowforge, our test we did in house, it was about a three to one difference on their 100% speed to our 100% speed. And that's on our Facebook, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So if you scroll back up through our live Facebook, uh, we do a demo side by side where we basically just ran the same basic file, uh, one next to each other, and their top speed is just much slower than our top speed. Now, granted, at uh, when you slow down your laser head, you can go much uh, deeper, and so their 100% speed uh, was a bit deeper than ours, but um, I mean, we can also, <laughs> you can always go slower. You, know, you can yeah, always yeah. slow down the laser. Uh, many times you don't need to go uh, very deep into the wood or like if you're engraving phones and things, like you only need to go uh, deep enough to get past the anodization. Uh, looks like we have a few questions piling up from Facebook. Sorry about that, guys. We'll get to these right now. Um, looks like Garrett from Austin wants to know, hey, Walker, <laughs> I've heard the fiber <laughs> laser cutters require very low maintenance compared to CO2 lasers. How do the fiber machines require less maintenance? That's a good question. So the Galva setup on a fiber is a lot more solid uh, when it comes to the technology. It's just, it's very straightforward. There's not a whole gantry. You have these Galvos moving back and forth and you have a single lens that pops through and then it has a long focus range. So you're not dealing with the laser bouncing off, you know, mirrors. It's going straight from the system. Uh, so there's just a lot less going on. Absolutely. So it's also a solid state system. So your source is not coming from, I don't say a fickle glass tube, but um, your source is going to last a long time. It's thousands of hours. Yeah, yeah. Do I, we haven't had one that's ever done that. So, yeah. so if you, I mean, you can take that to the bank uh, right there. If, um, if you're engraving, let's say, tumblers, and the fear was, I want to invest $10,000 into a large machine and engrave as many tumblers as I want, as I could. If that was really your goal and you wanted to solve that goal as efficiently as possible, really it's with a fiber laser, uh, maybe even with an open system where you can do more things. Um, it's going to be a lot more precise at that point. Absolutely. If I were to add another laser to my repertoire, it would certainly be a fiber laser, no questions about it. I want one. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm anxious to um, 
to actually do a lot more projects with the fiber laser as far as um, you know exploring the capabilities of it. Um, well, and you're the raster master, <laughs> and that's what it does. And that's and that's a key, right? So yeah, so we're excited to get uh, even more of those examples out with the fiber lasers. Uh, Mary J from Sun Valley, Idaho. We were just up in Idaho for the eclipse. What's up, Idaho? Uh, do you have any maintenance tips to make the laser tube last longer? Absolutely, a few things you can do, right? Yeah, so uh, laser tube, you want to keep it cool, obviously, and you want to maintain your distilled water. You mm -hmm. uh, um, wh wh one second. Uh, so clean the distilled water, keep it clean. You can also add Dow Frost, which is a propylene glycol additive, and that will keep it from freezing over too much. So if you have this in your shed and you live in a cold area, you don't want your tube to freeze. Cold area, what's that like? I don't, I don't know. I'm I don't know. It's 90 something here today already. The summer's begun. I know you've seen Game of Thrones, like winter's coming. It's the opposite here. Summer's yes. coming and it's, it's upon us. Uh, yeah. It just slaps you in the face when you walk outside. We're too pale for it. Yeah, um, this white does uh. not do well with that sun. Uh. This is not a good mix. To burn. Yeah. Uh, we have one question from Samar. Uh, I use a fume extractor. How can I get my HEPA filters to last longer? Uh, it's funny you should ask that. Uh, you can actually, um, it's about uh, getting the particulate from getting there. And we've actually, we're in development of a uh, pre-filter that will help a lot of with all of your fume extractors. So no matter what size fume extractor you have, we're actually developing a pre-filter that can help stop the particulates before it gets to the HEPA so that um, mostly you can shake those out and replace that filter very quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. So you can basically pull the pre-filter out, shake it out, and then replace it, uh, especially when you're doing a lot of cuts with wood and different things with a lot of glue and other things that are inside the material. Acrylic, believe it or not, has a lot of particulate that flies up when you're um, mm -hmm. vaporizing that material. So uh, we're addressing this issue, and uh, in the coming months, you'll have a solution from us that should help out a lot uh, to keep those HEPA filters from uh, from uh, being used too much. But what you can do as you go in, a uh, shop vac is your best friend uh, inside of your fume extractor. You can always get a little bit more life out of your, and again, this is not an end all be all. This will not fix or replace or even make like new your uh, your filters, but giving them a quick uh, shop vac will clear up a lot of that uh, filter debris that prevents airflow from going through. Because really that's when you can tell your fume extractor is not operating well, is when the airflow decreases and the uh, the exchange from the machine to the um, fume extractor becomes uh, diminished. So uh, you gotta yeah. keep airflow up. Your, f your fan's gonna be drawing hard and it could fail at that point. Absolutely, and that's something you gotta think about. If your fan is pulling at the same uh, amount, it's uh, really trying to achieve uh, the same suction. If it's fighting that whole time just to get air through, uh, you're really making a fan work harder than it wants to, and it's really going to diminish the life of your uh, your, um, your fume extractor. So think twice before stretching the life of those uh, filters uh, in other ways. But like I said, you can uh, take them out, knock them around, uh, shop vac, and help them out a little bit. But that can help get a little bit more life out of it. Looks like we've got one more. Oh, I'm sorry, one from Facebook, right, Chantel? Yes, we do. So uh, from Clint, he wants to know if there's a service life for the 2.0 lens for the Hobby Series. Service life. Um, like a warranty? How is he? Uh, how is he writing that? Just like that. Just like that. Um, so <laughs> there are like uh, when you purchase a car or anything else, there are certain things that require maintenance and your upkeep in order to keep well. So uh, while your machine has a one-year warranty uh, on it, uh, if if you never followed the suggested maintenance and you just never cleaned your lens and just neglected all the suggestions, warnings, and different things that we try to uh, make very apparent uh, through the setup process and maintenance process. Um, it would be similar to buying a car and then taking it back uh, and saying, I've driven 30,000 miles and these tires are worn. Yeah, it's um, a consumable. It's a, it's a consumable item, absolutely. So uh, in the same way, uh, you wouldn't look for the uh, car dealership to uh, necessarily uh, change your oil for you unless maybe you bought a Mercedes and that was part of your deal or whatever. But um, uh, those consumable items uh, do require some upkeep from you. Um, if you really keep your lens well, y you may never have to replace it. Um, that's yeah, that, that's why we're going over this. It's exactly why we spent so much time on it absolutely today. Um, and really, uh, if there's any other questions we have that might uh, help uh, length of life or something that might be confusing about what we explained with the optics and the importance of keeping it clean, uh, please ask away because really we can't stress enough how important it is to keep your machine clean and keep your optics clean. Um, it's expensive to exchange and uh, replace your lenses. Um, that's actually why we have one of the contests for it because we understand what a, uh, you know, that can be taxing at times, especially, you know, if, uh, you know, sometimes when you have a laser business uh, that business isn't always booming. 
and it's usually that time where your lens needs to be replaced or yeah. something like and that. The last thing you want is to get a big order and be like, I have to wait two weeks, you know, because I need to order lenses and mirrors. Uh, not that it would take two weeks, but no, if you order lenses, like they would probably take you three or four days to, to get there. But yeah. uh, still, it's not what you, you want to go through that. Um, and it's also something that's not bad to have on hand if you're someone who's doing heavy work on your laser. Uh, remember a hobby laser like a Muse or a H series, that's recommended for about 20 hours of use or less a week. Anything more than that, you're really in a professional use. So keep that in mind too as you're doing the maintenance and upkeep on your hobby series lasers. You really want to uh, do a bit more if you're uh, working uh, working more. Yeah, I was trying to read that as well. Yeah. yeah. Contest. Contest. You can always get another cleanse through the contest. Absolutely, yeah, and that's well, exactly why we run our weekly contest. Again, <laughs> hashtag FSL weekly contest. Uh, Charles will put it down here below again. Uh, if there's any questions about how to enter, I'll have a post again. Again, congratulations to our winner this week. Those wooden rings are awesome. It's a great idea for um, anyone out there. We'll actually probably do an example of that for next week's fashion contest right yeah. here on Laser Talk, 4 p.m. Uh, live every uh, week on Facebook. So if you're watching on YouTube as a uh, as one of this uh, repost, make sure you follow us on Facebook and get alerts when we do go live. And you know, pop in, say hi, ask a question, let us know what's going on. Let us know what you love about your laser, or maybe what you'd like to see a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, anybody out there using RE3? Anybody you got any comments, questions, concerns? There's a bunch of cool stuff. Did you guys notice that you can save all your bins right to your desktop so you don't have to save files on your Muse so your Muse runs faster and more efficient? It's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. That's one of my favorites. My favorite setting, though, is global settings. So that when you go up to the cog in the top left hand corner, I can have my raster settings preset. So, like, I, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, so anytime I drag in a file, my settings are the default settings. And that is cool. And I have my, my own little code now for the different colors of vector lines. So, like, reds for three mil cuts, greens for acrylic cuts, yellows for, you know, 10% marks if I'm, like, aligning something on it. That's so good. I got a system now. And I tell you what that system does saves me a ton of time. So if you can imagine not having to set up files anymore, if you're doing someone, if you're like engraving tumblers, mm -hmm. you can just set what the tumbler settings are, and then if you have an anomaly, you do something else, then you can change those settings. Yeah, like it's that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it I'm saves 30 that. seconds to a minute a job, but I'll take it anytime. Yeah, and if you're running the same thing all the time? Especially hundreds of jobs, absolutely. Like That Why saves not? a ton of time, yeah. Any more questions from uh, Facebook? Uh, we have a couple. One Excellent. from Nick. What is a good place? start with speed slash power settings to raster on birch plywood. Having a tough time getting some good contrast. Your videos with the hockey logo had a great contrast. I tried the settings used on that and couldn't get it as dark as you did. Let's see what we got here. So, um, was that with a pro machine? So, well, this was done on a pro, right? Yeah. So, here's, if anyone didn't see our live in the cut, we just were showing off at our pride for our local Vegas Golden Knights who start their second round playoff journey tonight. Yay. If anybody's uh, wanted to tune into that, I don't know what station it's on, but um, basically with contrast, like the thing I think you gotta think about with uh, birch ply is how deep you're penetrating into the wood. Now, I don't know how well you're gonna see here on this, but that is actually a three ply piece of material. The reason why this is dark is because Walker engraved past the veneer into what you consider like the meat of that, uh, that first thick layer of wood. Um, with your settings, um, low and slow is the way to go. If you have a, a hobby series and you use the same settings that Walker used, you'd have to adjust that uh, quite a bit. He was yeah. on a pro series with a 120 watt laser, correct? Yeah, so we yeah. if you have a 90 watt, you're gonna have to slow it down Absolutely. a bit to get the same uh, output. And also, it's the wood itself. Absolutely. Now, he's, uh, he mentioned using birch. I'm assuming he probably has something very similar to this. Very similar, yeah. but uh, there's always huge variables when it comes to it. I mean, I even on the same piece of wood, you can get variables depending on, you know, uh, how much glue is present in that area. Yeah. And yeah. Charles, would you bring up the uh, material test uh, icon if you could? The greatest thing actually that we have that could help you out here is our material test. Now, what you see below my face right here is how uh, a standard test would kind of look. So this is actually run right there on birch ply. And you can see with the gradient in the center is pure black, uh, pure white on the edge. And then the different color vector lines had different kind of effects as far as how much uh, the gradient was filled in. Now, I would run a quick material test. And honestly, if you're trying to get a nice, deep, dark engraving, I would run somewhere around 21 speed and then keep the power up in the 90 range. Um, Nice and slow, nice and high power. 
Uh, don't be afraid to go slow with those engravings, especially if you're trying to do something nice, deep, and dark. Now, it's on your muse, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. On the, that would be on a 45 watt hobby series. Now, if you're doing a 90 watt and you're trying to go that dark, off the hand, I would probably go 45 speed with around 75 to 90 percent power, depending on the type of wood, how dense it was, how humid it was, etc. Like that's where I would kind of dial in uh, from there. Uh, but really, there's a couple tricks you can do if you're trying to get a dark engraving too. And if you check out um, our ebook, you can actually see some of the tricks in there. Now, one thing you went over a couple weeks ago was masking. Yes. Um, if you go back a few videos, uh, Walker went over how you can mask in an item that you're going to engrave. Uh, like if you can imagine, this would have been masked with uh, masking tape all over it. And then when he engraved away, uh, the tape would be covering up the wooden area. So in that time, he could fill it with either a stain. Um, there's a few products out there that actually market themselves just to uh, darken. Yeah. Uh, it's basically a watered down stain um, in a spray bottle. But um, all those things work great. Um, and really, acrylic paint you use all the time when you do uh, acrylic and um, uh, wooden paint. Or yeah, wooden grains, right? I like acrylic paint. I also like. Uh, the rubberized spray paint. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's the best stuff because it doesn't bleed into the wood. Yeah, no, the least amount of bleed, uh, the better. So consider that too if you're going to do anything like that. Uh, less is more. Just use a little bit and work your way in. I've even used a Sharpie on certain things, on little detailed things where you can just go in there with a Sharpie pen. I've also picked up paint pens for that before because yeah, it's just nice. so easy to use. You can kind of blot it on and then just wipe it off from the top. Um, it's great for stonework uh, as well. And I've also noticed it on acrylic um, engravings, uh, like top acrylic engravings, not something you do from the back. Mm -hmm. Putting just a little bit of uh, white uh, in with it kind of just makes that acrylic engraving go just a little bit more mild. So like even cheating a little bit by putting a little white or diluted white in that acrylic uh, engraving can do a lot of help for you. Yeah, and if you want it clear, hit it with a hair dryer. Yeah, hair dryer. Uh, that's uh, actually Walker's favorite thing to do. Uh, so in the engraving, uh, basically the trough where it's been engraved, when you heat it up either with a heat gun or a hair dryer, all those little balls of... Like the vaporized like acrylic that's usually frosty. Yeah, kind of frosty glosses over, right? Yeah, it just glosses over and it's like a laser cut edge rather than, you know, that glossy look and sometimes you can see the lines, you know, they completely dissipate. It's Walker, pretty you're, cool. you're good with a hair dryer? Is that He's yeah. excellent with a hair dryer. I'm a little too good with a hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> I need to slow the speed down just a touch. Um, All the way. Looks like we have one more coming from uh, Jacob in San Diego. How do I know when my belts need replacing on my Pro 20? Any chance of a how-to video on replacing belts? Well, you'll know because it'll be extremely obvious it won't be working. It That's kind of a passive-aggressive <laughs> answer, Walker. <laughs> yeah. um, so the tension of your belts is essential for the squareness of your gantry systems. Uh, the tension on the belt uh, really is noticeable probably to the eye by there being just a little bit of slack. in yeah, the, the slack and, and in your actual engraving, there will be skipping of the teeth. So if it is actually skipping because of that slack. You'll see it in your design. Yeah. Sometimes you'll notice that in if you're making a perfect circle, which is a little bit of a jog in the circle. Yeah, I'm sorry for that passive aggressiveness. Um, it's OK. Uh, we'll work on that later. All right. <laughs> the uh, Jamie looks like we have one more about air bubbles. I think you talked about this a little bit. Uh, I have air bubbles in my laser tube. Is that bad? How do I get air bubbles out of my laser tube? It's actually not good at all. You don't want laser tube uh, bubbles. Uh, it's mentioned in our quick start guide and our manual extensively. There's actually a blog post about it as well. Air bubbles, no bueno. Uh, luckily, there's a couple of really easy solutions. Uh, the first one is my favorite, and that's just picking up uh, the left end of your hobby laser. Um, I think it's the same end on your uh, Pro as well. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, pick up the left end of your laser a little bit, and by the phenomenon known as gravity, the air bubbles will just make its way to the top and then flow back into the system and kind of uh, work them their way out very easily. Yeah, so those air uh, bubbles will come right out. And also another way is for pinching your tube. So if you can't lift your machine like it's 48, like the one right. in my garage, <laughs> then you just pinch that tube and pulsate it until those little bubbles come out. Uh, basically like uh, putting a thumb over the top of a garden hose, but just kind of midline. Yeah, yeah, midline yeah. pump it, but you don't want to hold it too much on a pro, uh, which I've done because the pressure on a chiller will just pop that thing right off your tube. Pop it, yeah, off the chiller, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just a little bit of uh, throttling, if you will, of the, uh, of yeah, the flow. Yeah, don't close yeah. it all the way and hold it there like I've yeah. done. 
Um, one, th one thing before we go, I wanted to say thank you to Jeff Hayes for seeing us last week. Oh, Jeff Hayes stopped by the studio. We did an episode in the lobby. It was great to have him and his wife in. Uh, they actually, I think, are still officiating the, uh, the tournament, the pool tournament here in town. So I doubt they had a chance to break away and catch this episode. But oh, yeah. if you're catching it on the repeat, Jeff, thanks so much for stopping by. We're looking forward to seeing more of what you're making uh, with your laser system. Jeff's one of those guys who's a woodworker. He's a retired vet, does a lot of woodwork, and he's gotten so much requests for his laser work that he's kind of gotten away from woodworking doing mostly uh, laser work. Uh, so his machine's already paid for itself, uh, as many others have. Uh, you can check out our blog about the return on investment, though, on those machines. If there's any questions about sort of how you're trying to get your money back uh, from your laser, and we actually talked about it extensively a couple of uh, episodes ago on Laser Talk. So if you want to watch a video on it instead, uh, check out the blog. Uh, just a few episodes back, you'll see that as well. Actually, I'll tell you what, we I'll put a link. link. Is it? It's right here. It's that, that, I think it's that one. So above right there, we'll put that little link for you uh, so you can click over to that last episode um, when we talk about return on investment of your blog. Uh, what else do we have for today? I think we got through most everything, didn't we? Yeah, we killed it. I think today was a We're great show. Did we, did we have an awesome show? I thought it was pretty High chill. Five us. All right, so again, uh, Friday Walker will be uh, doing a really cool uh, one-hour build. Now, uh, what do we have going on this week? Very simple but useful headphone, like an earbud wrap. Earbud wrap. So How you many people have your earbuds in a weird spot right now and they're not organized? Yeah, they're always tangled. Me. So yeah. you go to the gym and unwrap it. It's already nice there. Uh, I'm calling the project the earbuds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we need a cricket. Well, yeah, we need something. I thought it was clever. Full Spectrum Laser hiring for a new lead designer. <laughs> Anyone with creativity and <laughs> ideas on how to better Amen. name projects will be considered. Hater. Just kidding. No, Walker always comes up with creative stuff for us. And uh, really, I think we're getting close to our 60th free project online. So check back and to any of our previous projects if the uh, ear buds the earbuds don't sound too cool sure he's got some really cool designs got an owl a fish uh, what's the other one owl dead fish like bony fish oh yeah uh, bone fish yeah uh teddy bear oh teddy bear and uh shoot i forget and a plain one so if you want to do like a logo for a gym or something like that you can slap it on that design and then absolutely so if you think you about go. that this week's project a couple creative ones and then one all you have to do put your name or logo on or perhaps like Walker said, a local gym, a local tea shop, a local uh, maybe golf course would do something like that. Book place. Uh, a bookstore, yeah. that's a great idea. Um, the secret to having a good laser business is understanding all the different applications that your laser can go to different other industries. So take a look at back of some of our projects and see maybe how you can use some of our projects ideas to spring forward your laser business uh, and uh, have more offerings to your customers. That's great. That was great right there. Man. Did you write that? Can we? I this just came right off the top. <laughs> that can was we, awesome. Let's record that. Can we? Did, oh, we weren't recording? <laughs> ah, just kidding. We're still live here. Anyway, uh, that's all we have for this week. Again, Walker will be live on Friday with that uh, really cool earbud uh, rap project. We'll come up with a better name between now and then. Um, and uh, we also have our live laser engravings that we do. Uh, today we actually did one for a client who was looking to do, uh, what kind of material was that? That was chipboard and touche paper. Uh, which is a basically stacked thin paper uh, with a layer on top where we, uh, what do you call it, kiss cut? Yeah, so we wanted to kiss cut it and then actually cut out the outside cut. Now what that means is you basically cut through just the top layer of material uh, without going through the entire object and uh, Walker did that uh, pretty successfully. So if you look back on our live video just earlier today, you can see that example as well. So until uh, next week or until Friday for Walker, uh, this is Laser Talk and uh, keep making. Yeah, we'll see you next time.